All right, thank you all so much for being here. Um, so, just wanted to let everybody know that we have um, interpreters here for the following languages, uh, Spanish, French, and Nepali. And I think, I mean, Arabic, does someone here? Oh, come on up. Oh, you need Arabic. We were, and is anyone here that was going to do that interpretation? Yeah. Um, we don't have our Arabic here. Okay. Okay. They're not here yet, so hopefully they'll be here soon and they are going to cause Okay? So I'm going to get started for just a little section and then I'll pass it to each of these interpreters. Um, and then, kind of after this initial part, we'll you can find the person who speaks the language that you speak in. So we, the poor and dispossessed of this country, communicate in many languages. We are organizing a moral fusion movement across all lines of division, including language. Nosotros, los pobres de este país, hablamos muchas lenguas y muchos lenguajes. Eh, estamos organizando un, un movimiento moral tras las líneas de división, incluso el lenguaje. Uh, bonsoir. Nos somos una sociedad pobre y dépossédée de, uh, de este país y nos comunicamos en varios lenguajes. Nos somos una organización con uh, una moral, uh, un movimiento también, uh, sobre todas las cosas de la sociedad, en incluyendo todas las lenguas, todos los lenguajes. Nous sommes le groupe qu'on appelle le Vermont Worker Centers et nous comprenons l'importance et aussi l'engagement de créer un espace multilingual, multilinguistique si possible. Et pour cela, nous avons des interprètes en, 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 en français, en népali, euh, en arabique aussi et aussi en spanish. Et de temps en temps, nous travaillons des, interpr des, inter des interprétations Mais nous avons besoin de temps en temps de poser au fur et à mesure que cela est assez long. Namaskar. Ami Yodesko Gari Ataba Pichareko Samazma Bibina Basauru Bolunza. अनि यो संस्थामा चाहिँ विभिन्न भाषाको दो भाषाहरुको उपलब्ध गराइन्छ यहाँ धेरै भाषाहरु बोल्ने समाज छ द वर्मोंट वर्कर्स सेन्टर अंडरस्ट्यान्ड्स द इम्पोर्टेन्स अफ एन्ड इज कमिटेड टु क्रिएटिङ मल्टीलिंगुअल स्पेसेस व्हेन पोसिबल to that end, we have interpretation in Spanish, French, Nepali, and hopefully Arabic today. El Centro de Vermont de Trabajadores, estamos, eh, bueno, en, en, entendemos la importancia de y estamos comprometidos a crear espacios multilingües cuando tenemos la capacidad. Para este meta, tenemos hoy interpretación en español, francés, Nepali, y ojalá árabe. Arabic and Center is community very Spanish one saw France Nepali ra Arabic Matha Atarayo Dobasili Dobasili Bolni Belamajita Pamili Pundesa Mayati Porti Day the like Dobas Gadi Gordon Pata
Sometimes working with interpretation means that we need to pause or that things will take longer than if we were meeting in only one language. We are moving at the speed of liberation and slowing down is well worth it. We ask that everyone speak slowly and clearly today and we want to thank everyone for helping to make this a multilingual space. A veces trabajando con interpretación quiere decir que vamos a durar un poquito más, que vamos a tomar un poquito más tiempo que lo usual. Eh, estamos moviendo a, a la velocidad de liberación y nos vale la pena hablar despacito. Eh, queremos hablar lento y claramente y muchas gracias a todos para ayudarnos en hacer un, un espacio multilingüe. multilingüe. يعني بيقول لك طبعا نحن يعني نحن ضعيفين شديد تمام في هذه المدينة ونحن لازم شنو باللغة العربية نحن لازم نتكلم ونحاول ندافع على الناس في مدينة برمال ونوضح حقنا نحن يعني نعم مش لازم نشارك الناس في الطرات مثارات في عر في عرانا وطبعا بيقول لك المنظمة بتاع برمال هنا يعني فاهم الوضع إنه كويس فاهم الوضع اللي نحن يعني فيه حاليا فنحن لازم نكون شنو مثلا انه معاهم ك نشارك معاهم بارائنا بكل صراحه ونطرح لهم الحاجات اللي احنا مسؤولين منها نعملها في في حياتنا الجايه. يعني بيقول لك يعني في وعندهم جميع اللغات متوفره يعني اي حاجه انت مثلا كمحتاج اي حاجه في اللغه العربيه دائما متوفره في ممكن نشرح عليك باي لغه دايره وانت. اوكي. Okay, so now I'm going to invite the interpreters to join everybody. So um, if you speak Arabic, you'll follow yeah. Salali. Yeah. yeah, so you can find, yeah, and then um, Kamal. For, yeah, yeah, so you can um, join the crowd. And then Kate for Spanish and, and Eddie for French. So if you need that interpretation, please find the, the, those folks. So everyone get settled for a moment. So I uh, just want to make a couple of kind of like housekeeping announcements. Um, if anybody needs childcare, you probably already found it, but it's kind of, it's in the back uh, left over here. Um, if anybody needs to use the bathroom, you can go out these main doors to the left. Um, and we also want to let folks know that there is going to be video documentation today. Um, and so if you don't uh, want to be in a photo or video, if you could find Keith, which, who's raising his hand over there. Um, let's see. And then uh, if you do want to share your healthcare story, you can find Charlie over here. OK. Thank you again, all, all of you, for being here. Um, my name is Erin Keller, and I'm here today as a member of the Vermont Worker Center, an organization that has been fighting for human rights since 1998. We're here today as part of the Healthcare is a Human Right campaign on the heels of the one year anniversary of the start to the Medicaid cutoffs. In January, we held a rally inside the State House calling for an end to the Medicaid cutoffs. On the same day, the legislature introduced a bill, H721, to expand Medicaid and Medicare eligibility, which would allow tens of thousands more people in the state to access affordable health care. Over 100 people across the state called their legislators in support of the bill, and leaders from labor and grassroots groups, like the Worker Center, testified in support, asking for it to be made stronger. By the end of March, however, the House of Representatives had watered the bill down 
to a more modest expansion of Medicaid, of Medicare and D Dr. Dinosaur with a study of expanding Medicaid, paid for by raising taxes on corporations. We are supporting this bill because expanding public health care, oh sorry, I lost my spot, but because expanding public health care by raising taxes on those who can afford it is the right direction forward. And so this month we're, we're gonna be asking people to call our senators and to make sure the bill does not get watered down any further and can override a potential veto from the governor. As of February 2024, over 26,000 people in the state of Vermont have lost their Medicaid coverage and 6,000 have their renewal currently pending. What this means is that tens of thousands of our peers are paying more than they can afford or going without life-saving medication and treatment. I am one of these individuals. When I lost my Medicaid coverage in July of last year, I felt enraged, powerless, terrified, dehumanized, and alone. One of the ways I felt able to reclaim my humanity was by sharing my story and hearing from others going through something similar. Healthcare touches each and every one of us in some form or another, whether we are managing chronic illness with insurmountable medical bills or are in good health and unable to afford basic preventative healthcare. In this country, healthcare is not a guarantee and to solely rely on our politicians to manage our human rights is to be disappointed. We are here today to continue to weave our stories together as an independent social movement in the demand to create a new story about healthcare. One that centers ease, abundance, care, protection, and dignity for all. One that treats healthcare as the human right that it is. So what that's gonna look like for today is we are going to uh, watch a, a video uh, just after this about the nonviolent Medicaid army. And then we're gonna have a few speakers uh, that will share their stories um, about the impact that the Medicaid cutoffs have had. And then there will be an opportunity to uh, share stories in smaller groups with each other. And then we're gonna hear from Angelina about what the problem is, who can change it, and what is our plan moving forward. And then afterwards, there will be a, a meal here um, to share, again, in community. Um, and then we'll also have a, a pop-up clinic um, for folks to kind of get their vitals checked on the side over here and um, an option to do a photo petition to again kind of share your story. Um, and so yeah, just want to thank you all for being here again and then I think Kate you have the, we'll get the video started. Thanks everyone. Right now we're in a week of action across the country. The regular folks are organizing against healthcare profiteering.
is a growing militant force of poor and working people united across all identities, all regions, races, and issues. Do you know anyone who's been cut from Medicaid? Me. Um, even though we've turned in our paperwork, even though we've been trying to fight for it and talk to people that are just not the same and not cooperative. I lost my niece, Billy Joe Walker, for making $23 over the limit for Medicaid cutoff. My inhaler is $48 to $50. Without Medicaid, I'm not going to make it. Y'all denied my son, and now my child is dead. 600,000 people were cut from Medicaid under President Reagan. 2.3 million people lost their health care pre-COVID under President Trump. Now, up to 24 million people across this country are going to lose their health care, and it's not necessary. It shouldn't be this way. pointing the finger at each other and not up where it belongs. We know that this fight isn't one in a day, it's not one in a week, in a year, we have to be organized for the long term. And when the road gets rough and rocky, and the hill gets steep and high, we will sing as we go marching. So now we're going to hear a couple of stories from Bluetooth community members. disconnected. Bluetooth I'm pairing. <laughs> I'm Bluetooth. Um, so we're going to hear some stories from our community members um, that are here with us today. Um, so Leah, can I invite you up to start us off? And then we'll hear from Brett, and then I'll be reading for um, somebody else. Yeah. 
Thank you, Aaron. Um, yeah, I'm Ria. I, <laughs> I joined the Vermont Workers' Center in 2022. <laughs> Hearing how other people have been impacted by the healthcare crisis helped me reframe the ways that I had been struggling and to see my life in a larger political context for the first time. Um, I've been working low wage, no benefit jobs in the service industry for 10 years since I was a teenager. When I was 19, I got kicked off of Dr. Dinosaur. My parents were uninsured, so I couldn't get on their insurance. I didn't get benefits through work and never made enough money to buy insurance from the marketplace. I should have qualified for Medicaid at the time, but navigating the application process, all the hoops they make you jump through, was impossible. When I was 20, I developed an overuse injury while washing dishes at a hotel where I was paid partially um, in room and board. I didn't have insurance and couldn't access care for my injury. Most jobs in the service industry don't afford you unpaid off, unpaid time off, let alone paid time off. So if I rested my injured shoulder by taking time off from work, I would have lost my income and my housing at the same time. I continue to work and now, six years later, the condition is almost unbearable. The constant stress and overuse progressed what could have been a minor treatable case of tendonitis into a disabling spinal deformation and endocrine disorder that I will have to cope with for the rest of my life. I've spent my entire adult life cycling through low-wage jobs, trying to make enough money to make ends meet, but not so much money that I lose my access to Medicaid. I'll work at one place until the pain in my shoulder and spine become unbearable, and the only recourse seems to be quitting and getting a week, off, week of rest until my next job starts. Being disabled in this way without reliable access to care, employment, and housing is being caught in a destabilizing cycle that makes personal, professional, or physical growth nearly impossible. It's impossible to build any kind of stability because the foundation keeps getting ripped out. It doesn't need to be like this. I was fortunate enough to get back on Medicaid during the COVID-19 public health emergency. The two years when I had Medicaid and didn't need to worry about it were a real blessing. I started treatment and started healing. I made a little extra money and felt more financially secure. It was a window that let me, and a lot of us, see how having Medicaid for all would change our lives for the better. Now that they have called an end to a public health emergency, despite how COVID-19 rates continue to soar, I have lost and regained my Medicaid four times in the last two months. My income was well below the cutoff threshold and did not change, but because of clerical errors, I had to spend two months without access to Medicaid that I qualified for. I had to forego treatment again. Six years have gone by since my injury and it feels like I am still in the same place. It shouldn't be like this. We all have stories like this in some way. We are all impacted by the healthcare crisis. We all need Medicaid for all. Thank you. Thanks, Leah, for sharing. And uh, next, we're going to have Brett to share. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. I'd also like to thank the Vermont Workers' Center and the Poor People's Campaign for inviting us to this wonderful event. My name is Brett Rhodes, and I've worked as an inpatient licensed nursing assistant at the UVM Medical Center for six years. I'm also proud to be a vice president in the support staff union at the hospital. Uh, during my time as a healthcare worker at UVM, I've all too often seen the effects that our privatized, profit-driven healthcare system has on our patients. It's heartbreaking to see these patients, many of whom are incredibly sick and struggling with a new diagnosis, also have to struggle with the fear and anxiety of how they will pay for their care and their treatment. I've had patients too afraid to order meals out of fear of adding to their insurmountable medical debt. Something is very wrong here. And this anxiety is not isolated to the patients we see. 
Many of my friends and fellow union members have recently been kicked off of Medicaid, leaving them in the precarious position of no longer being able to afford the very health care that they helped to provide. Our union, Support Staff United, as well as amazing organizations like the Vermont Workers Center, the Poor People's Campaign, and the Nonviolent Medicaid Army, fight tirelessly for our to fix our broken health care system and to provide every Vermonter with equitable and affordable access to health care. And together we will continue to fight. Thank you. Thanks so much, Beth. Okay, so this next story I'm going to read, um, and I'm reading this on behalf of Dr. Ryan Quinn, who's a pharmacist um, at Lakeside Pharmacy here in Burlington. So just a little bit about Ryan. Uh, Ryan has worked in pharmacy in Chittenden County since 2014, starting as a pharmacy technician and working up to becoming a pharmacist in 2021. Since becoming a pharmacist, Ryan has moved from corporate to independent pharmacy, working at Lakeside Pharmacy since August of 2021. He's now the manager of Lakeside Pharmacy, and he works to assist the residents of Burlington and the surrounding area with access to medications and assistance with any medication-related questions in a judgment-free and supportive community-focused space. So I just also want to say before I read this that Ryan is the pharmacist that helped me when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and this is all, I'm one of the patients that he's speaking about um, and can attest to that from the other side of his care. Um, so this is uh, Ryan's share. As a pharmacist working in Burlington, I interact with and see the positive effects of Vermont Medicaid on a daily basis. Medicaid gives access to vital medications with a level of ease and accessibility not seen with private insurances. Having Medicaid means going to a new provider or using a new pharmacy doesn't come with the frustration of trying to figure out which card or ID number is the exact one they need. Instead, all you need is a short number from a single card and you receive health care in Vermont. It is a level of simplicity that should be commonplace in health care, but often is not. Beyond even physical accessibility of receiving health care, financial accessibility makes it even more wonderful. A patient's co-pays can range from nothing to only a few dollars per prescription. Even then, if a person is unable to pay for their prescription, this isn't a barrier, as copays can be waived so people walk away with their prescription, regardless of income. Whether it's a doctor's office visit, a dental appointment, or a blood pressure medication, Medi Medicaid ensures that people receive the care they need and deserve. It is the gold standard I hold every other insurance against. Unfortunately, the income limits on being eligible for Medicaid are far too low and far too binary. Patients of mine have found themselves kicked off Medicaid from making too much money, even if it's only by a margin of a few dollars a year. You are either under this line and covered by the best insurance in the state or you are over it and forced to use private insurance or no insurance at all. I have seen patients who have come to me excited with news of a new job quickly be shocked by finding that their new insurance is asking for tens or hundreds of dollars on a prescription they got for only a dollar a month prior. Even worse, these private insurance companies can look at a patient who has been stable on a medication for years with Medicaid and say, this is not on our formulary. We refuse to fill this. Forcing someone to use another potentially subpar choice and disrupt their lives. These issues have regularly caused patients of mine to go from stable on medications that keep them healthy 
to suffering from in infrequent access due to cost of the drug or arbitrary formulary limitations from these massive conglomerates. I cannot stress enough the pain it causes to see healthy people shaken up and potentially made to suffer from lack of medical access when they are, by every metric, doing the right thing. Healthcare is a human right and no one should be punished by a lack of access when we have the foundation of an incredible system that should be used by all Vermonters. One that is focused on the patients and providers it is supposed to help and not on shareholders who pursue a perpetually inflated bottom line. An insurance that should be supported and expanded instead of slashed and restricted. An invaluable resource to a huge number of patients and one that I would want nothing more than to see expanded to every single person in Vermont. Easy access, affordable health care that is good for everyone, a simple idea that can and should be achieved, an idea that I fully believe in and fully support for the good of all Vermonters. So that's Brian's Lakeside Pharmacy. So now we want to turn it over to all of you folks who are here with us today. And um, this is an invitation if anybody in the audience here today has a story about healthcare that you'd like to share kind of right here, right now. Is anyone feeling called? It's okay if not. <laughs> So instead of having somebody share or just come up here, now will be an invitation to turn to your neighbors, maybe find one person or a couple of other people, and just start a conversation about healthcare, what it's been like for you to navigate healthcare. And we'll do this for about five minutes. You can kind of turn to your neighbors or go kind of find other folks. So we'll come back in about five minutes, so just take some time to uh, connect with each other. So I first just wanna say that I'm feeling really inspired seeing so many people talk to each other and just how engaged everyone seems to be. It's really, um, this is the reason that we're here. Um, and I think it just kind of proves the fact that healthcare touches each and every one of us in some way or another. Um, so I'll, in, I'll turn it over to all of you now again, if anyone's feeling inspired to share anything that stood out to you in your conversations, even just what you're feeling right now after hearing from other people, anything that felt surprising. Um, this is just an invitation for any reflections and I can pass the mic if anyone's feeling called to share. I have a question. Sure. Are you guys doing down the period that like actually need to see both? Yeah. There's been um, I mean there's been legislative meetings. Um, I'm not sure do you know of anything coming up in the near future? There have been a few rallies. Um, there was a group of us that spoke and testified with the House Healthcare Committee um, about the Bill H721. Um, so there are actions that have happened and will happen. Um, there is an email list we could probably set you up and signing up for so you get the um, notifications on any events coming up. Anyone else want to share? Oh. Uh, wow, that's loud. Hi, my name's Quinn. Um, I should stand up? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, how's it going? Good? Okay, good. Um, 
So, um, uh, let's see. Uh, I've been on Medicaid since about 2017 when I had to um, live homeless for a while and not work in order to receive Medicaid because I've been in and out of psych hospitals over like 10 times throughout the course of my life. Um, I have bipolar disorder. I take lithium twice a day along with uh, antipsychotic medications um, to stay stable and healthy. Um, and I live with uh, debilitating drug addiction, which has been in remission for a few years now. Um, thank you. But uh, I got a, it wasn't a letter, but it was one of those cards from the state that said, you're on Medicaid, this is what the red letter looks like if we send it to you. And the red letter isn't, um, well, I don't know that, but it's, it's, uh, it's basically, said, it's, a red, it's a letter with a line through it on the front that's red, and it says, you are no longer on Medicaid. And I just thought that would ruin my life if I couldn't uh, afford my medications because I make pizza for a living and I can barely afford to, afford to pay my bills as it is. Um, I also take PrEP, I'm a member of the queer community and that helps prevent, uh, it's like an HIV prophylaxis, it prevents getting HIV. And um, I'm just thinking if uh, that would be extremely, that would just be blatantly unaffordable if I uh, weren't on Medicaid. Um, and like that pharmacist said, it's very easy to pick up your medications. Um, it's free for me, which sometimes, like this week, is uh, entirely necessary. And um, I'm just thinking, when I saw that letter, that I could risk uh, my physical, mental, and um, uh, clean self if I weren't on Medicaid. So that's my story, thank you. Oh, I got this. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to share that I was on Medicaid and then I um, went on disability and it was very shocking because then they suddenly put me on Medicare and um, my life became quite hellish. And um, just for anyone who doesn't know, when you're on Medicare, there's just a lot of things you have to pay for that you didn't have to before. Um, and um, it doesn't cover things like a naturopath. It doesn't cover dental anymore. So I've had to get like a whole bunch of different insurances. And also because my situation was kind of unique, um, there was uh, just so much confusion in all my communications with all these systems. Uh, which was pretty overwhelming for me because I had recently found out that I have autism and ADHD and the last thing I'm really good at is um, communicating with people in systems. Um, so, you know, I, I think like a while back there was like a conversation about Medicare for all, but I can say we don't want Medicare for all, we want Medicaid for all. Um, but even Medicaid for all is not without its issues because um, uh, I don't know the specific reasons why this happens to some people, but some people are forced to pay back their Medicaid bills. Like I was reading a story about a family where um, the mom passed away. She you know, had left the house to her kids and um, Medicaid, you know, uh, made the kids sell the house. Um, so it really affects things like generational wealth, you know, which ends up affecting um, all kinds of equality issues in our community. And I feel like it's something, you know, that uh, as we're changing laws, we have to look at all the different ways that our government um, manipulates people out of their money and. Um, is exploitative of us, our labor, um, and um, you know, I think it's really great being in this community because I feel like we care about each other's health, and I think we're gonna build that world by how much we care about and look out for each other. So I just wanted to share all that, thank you.
so much for that. And I think we have time for maybe one more um, story if anybody is feeling called to share. Right. Okay. Oh, awesome. All right. I feel like everyone else is way more qualified to tell their story than me, but uh, since no one else raised their hand, I'll get up here and share a few words. Uh, I'm addicted to snowboarding. Uh, it's a debilitating habit uh, that occasionally results in injury, uh, especially when you're going down through the trees. So I broke my ankle in 2017 and um, you know, swole up about like this big. And so uh, we took an x-ray and uh, they said, you know, you're fine, it's not broken, just walk around, go back to your life. And um, one of the technicians said, you know, really it would make more sense to take an MRI, but you know, your insurance is not gonna pay for that. MRIs are like $4,000. Well, in Japan, uh, where they have a nationalized healthcare system, uh, where they've taken the profit motive out of the healthcare system to some extent, MRIs are 20 times cheaper. Uh, and so people are able to get the imaging that they need right out the back. Uh, so after about a month of walking around on my broken ankle, um, I was like, man, I'm feeling really terrible. Uh, I still have a lot of pain. Can I get that, please, can I get that MRI? And um, they were like, no, uh, you need to be in more pain. You need to be more sad. And uh, so somehow got the MRI and they're like, we're so sorry. Uh, yeah, you do have a broken ankle, so walking around on it for a month was uh, was not really the thing to do. Um, so yeah, I have uh, arthritis in my left ankle now. I can no longer uh, run or do a lot of things I like to do. Um, but the but I feel like so many of us today have just talked about how unnecessary this all is. You know, it's just so that um, a handful of billionaires on Earth uh, can just be astronomically rich and, and confused about even what to do with that wealth. Um, and so, yeah, what are, what are we gonna do about it? I mean, I think if we look around the world um, at countries that have one, uh, single payer or nationalized health systems like the UK, it, it's about the working class getting organized, you know, um, organizing the unions, organize our workplace primarily, but organized as tenants um, community organizing, this right here, like what we're doing right now, we're getting organized, we're getting our stories organized, we're getting to know each other, relationships are power, and uh, I'm just so lucky to fight alongside you. Thanks, Sierra. And that was, you know, a beautiful transition to turn things over to Angela, who's gonna talk just about that, and what's next, and what the problem is, and how can we can change it. Wait, can you hear? Oh, there it is, there it is. Hi, my name's Angelina. I've been a member of the Vermont Workers Center since 2021, I believe. Um, first of all, I just seriously want to express so much appreciation for those sharing their stories and for everyone for listening. It's really so impactful and you are all so resilient, strong people. You know, I think in the system, you're forced to be resilient. You don't have any other choice but to be resilient. And so yeah, thank you all for sharing your stories and they're, they're really powerful because when the state of Vermont chooses for thousands of us to be kicked off their only source of healthcare coverage, you're really reminded of your dispossession as a working class person, and you're reminded of the, that our state's priority, our country's priority is profits, not our health, not our lives, but profits. Um, and so our stories are our power, there are points there, they are our points of connected, you know, there's many new faces here for me, people I've never met, but I feel so connected to you from sharing, from the story you shared. 
And so that's all to say and to reiterate what Aaron had said at the beginning of today's event, you know, by sharing our stories, we really are taking back our power. So continue sharing your story. It's so such a powerful thing. So this year, as you probably know, or maybe even experienced, Vermont kicked around 25,000 people off of Medicaid, and this is following the one million Medicaid cutoffs made last year nationwide. Now, everyone's healthcare story is different. The distinct impacts that being denied healthcare has is different, but at the end of the day, everyone is impacted, and our struggle shares the same root cause. People who have private insurance are impacted as well. Let me say that there are 140 million poor people and people who are just one emergency away from becoming poor in our country. And out of those 140 million people, those who are forced to pay an arm and a leg for their private health insurance are just one accident, one missed paycheck, one unpredictable emergency away from having no coverage at all. So if that happened, how many of those people would make the threshold for Medicaid, you know, when so many people who already need it are being denied? So too many people do not have access to health care, and that's because the corporations that dictate this country deny them their access. Too many people do not have a stable roof over their heads because this country denies them a home. Vermont faces a healthcare crisis, a housing crisis, a human rights crisis. The US is denying its people of their basic human rights while also simultaneously ending thousands of lives in Gaza. In 2011, after years of organizing, the Vermont Workers Center secured the passing of Act 48. Act 48 is Vermont's universal healthcare law. But do we have universal healthcare in Vermont? No. What's up with that? Seriously. Oh my goodness. Thousands of us just lost our access to healthcare. And at the time, the governor explained that universal health care would just be impossible to fund. So even though it's the law, it goes unfunded. But if Act 48 were implemented, 93% of Vermonters would have full health care coverage and also higher incomes. But meanwhile, our country is spending billions of dollars to bomb hospitals and schools in Palestine and completely destroy their healthcare system. And yet we're told that we can't fix our own healthcare system. So Martin Luther King Jr. saw a very similar contradiction in 1967. In his speech, Beyond Vietnam, Dr. King stated that a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social justice. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Our country's priorities are killing us, and additionally, they're polluting our planet. War is one of the greatest contributors to carbon emissions. And this is only exacer exacerbating the poverty and the illness that too many people are unjustly and unnecessarily experiencing. So not only is healthcare extremely expensive and difficult for most of us to access, but its quality is even compromised by corporate greed and by racism. It's more dangerous for us to have children now than it was for our parents. Maternal and infant mortality rates have increased for everyone, but especially for black mothers, even black mothers who are wealthy. Hospitals make more money by performing C-sections, 
even though they put mothers at higher risk for complications when they're not necessary. And because it's profitable to minimize the time mothers spend in the hospital and in labor. So all this is to say that hospitals are profiting from maternal death. Under capitalism, illness and death are a source of profit. And our entire society is structured to make us sick from extremely stressful and over-demanding work environments to air pollutants to the foods that are most accessible for us. In the same speech, King urges that we must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. He warns that when machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. But I want to talk about how we can move to what King calls a person-oriented society. And I think we had a glimmer of insight, right, right? So we have to get organized and build our power as the people. I want to quote Asada Shakur. She was an incredible black revolutionary and she said, nobody in the world, nobody in history has ever gotten their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of the people who were oppressing them. Yeah. <laughs> Medicaid cutoffs, I want to remind, were supported by both political parties. So it's clear that our human rights are not the concern of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. We have to unite across all lines of division, our political divides, our racial divides, our gender divides, all lines of division to create a person-oriented society and to resist our oppression. Martin Luther King organized the original Poor People's Campaign in 1968, which was also the year he was assassinated. Um, and the collective movement from, and the Poor People's Campaign is the collective movement from which uh, the nonviolent Medicaid army is modeled after. So who knows about the nonviolent Medicaid army? We just watched that amazing video, right? Right, right, right? Yes, yes, yes. So the nonviolent Medicaid army is a united network that aims to be a new and unsettling force made up of the poor and the dispossessed. Over 90 million people in the US rely on Medicaid for healthcare and a third of Vermonters are on Medicaid. And this doesn't even include those who are excluded or cut off from its access. And um, I want to quote directly the nonviolent Medicaid army. Those who are on or excluded from Medicaid represent the diversity of the entire working class and are impacted by every single front of struggle there is, be it the fight for housing, a healthy environment, living wages, food, education, freedom from debt, freedom or of migration, or freedom from criminalization and incarceration. This fight for our human rights, for a, for a people-oriented society, requires unity. And as the national, um, as the nonviolent Medicaid army often says, we might not be able to out might or out, might, uh, or out money those profiting from our suffering, but we can out organize them. We are leading the fight for healthcare by sharing our stories. We just today we're seeing how powerful it is. And if you have a story of how you're impacted by the healthcare crisis, we are sharing them through our photo petition. If you have a healthcare story, you can write why we need universal health care, and we'll share those photos. And as a collective, it tells the, it tells the story of why we need health care. So 
Here we are actively bringing together the poor and the dispossessed because we have incredible power as a collective movement. And when we are united, we can persuade any legislator to fight for our cause. Just this past January, we were, we were at the State House telling our policymakers why we need universal health care, why we need H721. And as a collective, we have the power to determine who our policymakers are. For instance, uh, the previous mayor, Weinberger, was mayor of Burlington for over a decade, right? But through collective organizing, grassroots collective organizing, we were able to elect a new promising mayor, Emma uh, Mulvaney uh, Sainik. And so every conversation we have, you know, just a few minutes ago, we were, I was so absorbed into the conversation I was having. I learned so much from talking to people and forming those connections. So every conversation we have, every march that we organize in May, we'll be having our annual March for Medicaid. And every story we share, is one step toward equitable, just healthcare system. And beyond that, a world where everyone has a roof over their head, food in their stomach, the freedom to love who they love, the opportunities and resources to bring their dreams into fruition. And this is the dream that I have and that many of us have. And I believe that we can make this dream a reality when we organize and we unite as a collective force. So I'm gonna say, who are we? And we'll say, the Medicaid Army. Ready? Who are we? Medicaid Army! Who are we? The Medicaid Army! Louder, I need to hear who are we? The Medicaid Army! And we're going to fight for our human rights. Thanks so much, Angelina. All right, so to close us out and finish off also with the song, I think we have maybe Crystal and Keith, or Keith, both. Keith, I can't sing. Come on up. <laughs> um, and then after that, um, we'll transition to food and whatnot, so I'm gonna pass this over. Yeah, I'll stand next to you. Hi, hello. Um, so yeah, so I don't have too, too much to say. Um, I'm just kind of, you know, Wrapping things up, closing things out, um, a bunch of great, you know, speeches and stories and very, you know, meaningful and moving experiences that, you know, are not, not even close to the totality and like total amount of, you know, these stories that are like for, for every like one person here, there's dozens of other people who are going through the exact same thing and not just here in Vermont. Um, but, um, yeah, so the, what I wanted to share was kind of my, a little, supplemental information as a history teacher. Um, well, starting next semester, but wink, wink. Um, but yeah, so looking at, thank you, thank you. Um, so looking at history, we've seen, just like Angelina was saying, that um, rights have had to be fought for. Um, you know, you, you quoted Asad Shakur. The Black Panthers were certainly not, um, you know, they couldn't be said to not be militant. They were very organized. They read, you know, theory. They were very um, researched, very knowledgeable, and very active. And it was very, this was during a time when, you know, there was great, like, attitude and, you know, beliefs aside, racism and segregation were very profitable to the system at that time, and they still are. But um, that was something that was part of the status quo and needed to be organized and actively antagonized against. And the reason that something so profitable and integral to the system was able to be changed was because of that organizing. I also think of like 
you know, the disability movement. Um, those, um, the, you know, the federal legislation requiring like disability ramps on buses, that didn't happen because someone was like, oh, you know, why don't we, why don't we go ahead and add those? It happened because uh, this group, I think it was called the Atlantis Group in Denver, they kept throwing themselves in, t in front of buses and they said, we're gonna do this every day until um, like the city or state reps here meet with us and agree to make buses accessible, sidewalks accessible, all that good stuff. Um, so that is to say that like, this is something that needs to be fought for, and just like all you know, social progression in the past. Um, and as Angelina also mentioned, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans have a, you know, a thing on the table saying we're going to pass uh, you know, health care support. In fact, um, you know, obviously we know the Republicans have pushed very hard to, against you know, the ACA. They re reduced the tax on the individual mandate, or um, whatever you call it, to zero. But also Joe Biden, uh, in 2022, he hired Liz Fowler, who said her goal is to privatize Medicare completely by 2030. Um, so it is very clear that neither of these parties, um, as opposed as they may seem to be, have the interest of the working people, the majority of people in America, in mind. Um, so now that's really easy to hear, and it's really easy to be like, um, yeah, okay, that, that sucks. So what do we do? How do we get involved? How do we, you know, follow in the footsteps of like these past movements? Um, well, I've got a couple ones. The easiest one, first and foremost, is to keep in the loop. And so you can do that by following us on social media. Um, if you got a phone, go ahead and take it out. If you got Instagram or uh, Twitter, I'm gonna go ahead and give our handles. Um, yeah, I'll give people a second to take them out. All right, so on Instagram, we are at Vermont Workers Center. Um, on Twitter, we are at VT Workers Center. And then our website is workerscenter.org. Um, I know that, what was that? Oh, I thought I heard something. Woo, okay. Anyway, so I know that if this is your first time coming to something like this, you probably have some questions. Like, okay, yeah, it sounds good, but like, you know, how do we, how are we going to pay for it? How are we going to, you know, all these questions. And they're fair questions because it's like, you know, in theory, like, how would this work? How, you know, it's, it, I hear people saying, oh, people will have more money. Oh, this will be more efficient. But how? Um, and so on the Worker Center, I highly encourage everyone to check out our website after. Just skim around. We have full, like, documents showing, like, exactly how we plan to do, like, the financial side of it. I think there's, like, a 37-page document, like, outlining how it actually saves the state money to do a single payer policy. Um, and then the very last few things is to let people know what we got coming up. Um, over the next few months, we're going to be both meeting with uh, state officials and also calling in, uh, in to show support for Bill H721. And if you're following us on our socials or if we have you on like our email list, we'll be sending out uh, emails with ways you can get involved whatever you're able to and comfortable doing. Um, and let's see, we're also having our summer organizing drive. I don't know, I think we'll probably be sending out some more information on that. Um, and then yeah, if, so Keith is up after me, but before he gets into the musical side, if there's any events he wanted to like mention that people can be on like the lookout for, or. Nothing off top. Yes. Uh, do you want to, yeah, can I do your mic? The service? Yeah. Are we going to send them out by email? We have them here. Oh, period. Okay. So before you go, we have a bunch of little um, like leaflet thingies. Uh, we're encouraging, in, in fact, we're demanding everyone take five of them, bring them back with you, give them to people, get you know people thinking about their health care, <coughs> thinking about their you know their connection to it. Because um, some people here might agree with the message, but might not personally be affected. Um, I'm very fortunate to have kept my Medicaid this year, um, but we all have a lot of people in our lives who aren't necessarily sharing like what they're going through. Like, you know, it's not fun to be like, oh yeah, probably gonna be in debt forever because I can't pay my bills for my medical costs. Um, so we're hoping that yeah, everyone, please, please, please take five surveys or more if you want.
But the goal is for everyone to take at least five and then uh, pass them out to people in your life. Start that conversation with other people. Get that conversation and that dialogue going and um, see just how much we, through all our many differences, all share this common uh, connection to and challenge with healthcare. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna pass it over to Keith. And yeah, oh, the thing. Yeah. Let's put it right here. Is that gonna roll off? Can we turn it off though? I think so. Test, we're off. Am I, am I just loud or is it? Okay, I think. All right, everyone, and we're gonna eat in a minute, have the health screening clinic, um, but I just wanted to um, put out, so somebody's hurting our people and it's gone on, and you all say, far too long. It's gone on, far, far too, too long. long. Somebody's hurting our people and it's gone on far, far too long. long. And then we all say, and we won't be silent anymore. Does, it, does anyone know the song? Some people have heard it maybe. Whoa, 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 somebody's hurting our people and it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. I tell you it's gone on far too long. Oh, oh, somebody's hurting our people and it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. All right, somebody's hurting our brother. We're gonna sing it together. People feeling it? All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the spinner? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> All right. This isn't about me or Jordy singing. This is, this is y'all, us singing. You know, it's part of a movement. Somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. Well, I tell you it's gone on Whoa, whoa, somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. Did you hear somebody's hurting my sister, and it's gone on far too long? Yes, it's gone on far too long. Well, I tell you, it's gone on. Somebody's hurting my sister, and it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. Let's say that two more times. And we won't be silent anymore. Last one, last one, a little louder. And we won't. that keep so um, now we're gonna transition to um, food in the back on the left over here and then please visit our pop-up clinic um, health clinic on the side on the left over here as well um, and that's where the surveys will be thanks everybody